the learning algorithms for decision trees. Um, and um, we're going to learn invariance, right? And then um, I'll tell you what implication counterexamples are and why they're important. Um, it's unfortunate I have to give this talk because uh, the main people who did this work are Pranav Garg, a student, and a postdoc, uh, Daniel Nider, and both couldn't make it uh, for various reasons. So, um, so what's the problem? Um, the way I look at it, um, and this, this is more widely applicable, but the way I look at it is in a deductive verification setting where we are trying to prove a program that is written um, already, correct? Right, and uh, think about VCC, Boogie, Z3 kind of pipeline, where most of the verification conditions are checked to be valid using automated theorem provers, SMT solvers, and so on. Right? And so, so what are we given? We're given a correct program. Let's assume it's correct for now. I mean, the, um, and uh, it satisfies the assertions written in the program, and it's partially annotated with preconditions, postconditions, assertions. Right. And what we want to do is find inductive invariance that will prove this program correct using you know, uh, flawed hostile kind of verification or deductive verification. So you want to strengthen the pre and post conditions. You want to add loop invariance so that you can prove all the assertions in the program correct. Okay. So that's the, the high level problem. So uh, you, if you think of the space, state space of the program, then you have um, if you're doing, since you're doing modular verification, right, um, you, you're looking at one uh, module. It has some uh, precondition, which is the initial states, right? And you have the set of assertion, the negation of the assertions, which is your set of bad states, which you have to stay away from. And since the program is correct, um, we expect that, you know, this is going to happen is that uh, you, you, the, the set of states is, you're not going to be able to reach the bad states. And an inductive invariant is a proof that you can't. Um, it's a standard, you know, inductive hypothesis kind of proof, and it says that you know you're find a set I which includes all the initial states, and it should uh, not exclude. It, it should exclude all the bad states, and it should be post-closed. So if you can show such, that such a, such a set exists, then you're through. Uh, that you've proved that program is correct. Um, note that the reachable state will be, a, um, you know, is, is an invariant, right? But it could be quite complex. You know, you don't want to always talk about the reachable set of states because you will find simpler invariants which are larger. Right? Um, so, so the inductive invariant is typically driven by the property that you're trying to prove. Depending on the property, you could you could find much simpler invariants. Okay. So there are many invariants, right? And you have to synthesize one adequate invariant to prove your property. And you don't you don't you, you want the, in some sense the simpler ones. Right. So. So when you verify software this way, and we have done some projects where we have actually built uh, some mobile operating systems and we have verified code, um, what you have to do really is go and sit in and do all these by hand. You have to specify loop invariants by hand, and you, know, you can validate the invariant using, using the tool chain. Um, so the, the, once you write the invariants and it's strong enough, you know, for simple properties, you know, the tool chain would work. You can usually prove it correct. But for more complex properties involving the heap and so on, it's still, there's still work to be done. It's, it's not clear how to do that automatically. But specifying an invariant is more, mo mostly manual today, right? Uh, and it's really the main bottleneck to automatic, automatic verification. Um, also, it's true that you know, loop invariants typically are very hard to write. They're not uh, uh, easy for pe programmers to think about. And um, uh, they, they don't know exactly why they're writing it. So it's, it's kind of hard for them to to write these invariants. So this is, um, this is from the Express OS work where we built this operating system, where even simple things like looking up the cache page or something, you have a while loop uh, going through an, uh, a link list, and then you have, a, you, know, uh, you have a class invariant, and you have some post condition that you want to prove. You, know, you have to write loop invariants. And loop invariants you know, get hard you know, even for very simple things. So, so that's my main motivation, so um, uh, to, to somehow synthesize these invariants so that people don't have to write them. So the traditional approaches for doing this are um, white box approaches, which look at um, the all right. um, they look at the, the actual program. 
right? And there's, there are many approaches, right? Uh, you, can, you can think of it abstract interpretation. You could use abstract interpretation techniques. You can look at it as uh, some Farkas lemma based approaches are there. There's interpolation, there's IC3, and so on. But um, the one I'm going to concentrate on that should be black box, I'm sorry, there's a typo. The black box approaches, which have been explored more recently. And the idea is to learn the invariant not from the program itself, but from samples that you derive from the program. So what is synthesis using learning? It's this old uh, Indian story of you know, uh, how do you deal with an elephant, right? How do you understand an elephant, right? You, you close your eyes, right? You blindfold yourself, and then you, you touch the elephant at various parts and figure out what it is. And you get kind of facets of this elephant and you try to understand the elephant, right? And the elephant here is the program which can be quite complex, and you don't want to actually deal with the program structure. You want to uh, ex extract some facets of it and learn the invariant from that. So, so the technique for finding the invariant is to ignore the program first, right? Um, and you extract some sample configurations about what the invariant should satisfy, right? So certain things should maybe belong to the invariant. Certain things should not belong to the invariant. And from this, you can try to synthesize a formula that satisfies these samples, right? And then you, you, you propose this, the learning algorithm will propose this invariant. And there's a verification oracle, which is a separate oracle, which knows the program. It knows the specification, right? And it checks whether the proposed invariant is correct. I'm sorry for this. I don't know how to fix it. It's just coming out of the... Um, sorry? So, so um, the idea is that the verification oracle will check whether this inductive invariant given by the learner is correct. Right? Is it an inductive invariant that proves the program correct? If it's not, it's going to tell you more about the invariant. It's going to say, no, 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 I, you, know, you should satisfy something else. And then the learning algorithm learns again. And you go through this loop, and uh, it's like a counterexample driven uh, uh, synthesis loop. And you, in this way, you try to, to, to learn this invariant. So in this work, we're going to use machine learning algorithms for the learner part of this work. So there has been previous work by us where we've used other kinds of learners, but here we're trying to use machine learning algorithms. So is it a wacky idea? I think certainly it is, right? And it's good to look at, look at this idea a little bit more. Um, and the real reason why I think it's a good idea is that the program can be incredibly complex, right? That's the elephant in the room. Um, the, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a complex memory model, there's complex semantics, there's pointers, heaps, and so on. But the invariant you're synthesizing might be over a much simpler logic, right? So instead of reasoning with all that um, uh, uh, heavy logic that, the, the, that you need to verify, about the, verify the program, you kind of, kind of get away from that. And I think that's, that's uh, a very attractive part of this. Um, the other part is that the user would partially annotate the program in this approach. Right? I mean, not everything is going to be synthesized. There will be some parts of the program which will be annot uh, annotated by the programmer, which gives key insights as to why the program is correct. Right? And you, you want to automate the rest, which is kind of boring and simple and so on. Right? And so, but in, in a white box approach, you'll have to reason with what the user has written as well. And that can be in complex logics. It can have quantifiers. It can involve separation logic. Right? You, learning an invariant in that setting is hard. When you do have, when you're going to look at the program, so inductive learning basically ignores all this complexity and learns over some um, a, an abstraction of the program, which is very simple. And the guess and check scheme is driven by counterexamples, right? And it allows you to also verify, have the verification oracle uh, deal with undecidable theory. So, so if you have quantification and arrays and heaps and so on, typically the verification oracle is not going to be a decidable oracle. Right? It's going to be a sound but incomplete kind of oracle. Right? And it allows you to even use um, uh, strategies which um, uh, theorem provers use to handle undecidability. So it is not uncommon. So Houdini is actually a nice learning algorithm, and the, the kind of learning algorithm that you're going to talk about. Right? And G Houdini has been used quite widely. One application is GPU verification for race freedom where people have used it to actually uh, find invariants which prove race freedom for, for, for GPU codes. 
Um, there's, uh, there's also been some work on invariant generation using stochastic search, constraint solving, automata, et cetera, which have, which have used um, uh, black box learning. Um, and if you move more, more widely into synthesis of program, program synthesis, so program expression synthesis, black box, invariant, uh, black box synthesis is the norm, right? It's not the exception, right? Because the, the thing that you want to synthesize is pretty complex. And what you do is you typically you'll extract counterexamples, and it's called counterexample guided inductive synthesis. And so black box synthesis is actually the norm. And if you look at it like a Saigus synthesis competition, which was which have been held in the last two years, essentially all solvers are black box uh, 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 black box synthesizers. So there's some evidence that this black box synthesis approach is a good idea, right? But the jury is still out. Okay, so what do we? What kind of samples should the should the teacher feed the learner so that the learner can can conjecture query uh, invariants? So the standard thing which you think about from a machine learning perspective is that you know you'll have positive and negative examples. Okay, certain configurations should uh, be uh, or should belong to the invariant. If you look at the invariant as a set, uh, certain configurations should be contained in the invariant, and certain kind of configurations should not be contained in the invariant. And if you look upon this as um, um, the task for the learner would be find a simple formula that includes all the positive examples and excludes all the negative examples. So if you know machine learning, that the, there's usually a bias, right? And the bias is towards learning simple things, right? And the simple, by learning a simple formula, you hope to generalize away from this positive and negative examples. So you can't say only pick the positive ones and exclude only the negative ones or something like that. You can't, you can't do that because that'll be a large formula. Right, but it turns out that this is not robust enough for invariant synthesis, and this is one of the biggest problems, is that we can't take machine learning algorithms off the shelf and use them, because it turns out that this is not robust, at least for, for invariant synthesis. Um, you need another kind of counterexample, which the teacher should be able to give you, and these are called implication counterexamples, and this consists of a pair of configurations C and C prime, right? And, um, and, the, and the learner should come up with an invariant which, if it includes C, then it should include C prime. So it could, it could choose to exclude C, in which case it, there's no constraint. Or if, but if it includes C, it must include C prime as well. Okay, and I'll tell you why these implication count examples are needed. Okay, so let's say this is your diagram and somehow there's a good states and bad states and the, and the, and the um, learner proposed this invariant H which did not include all the pre-states of your program, right? All the states that you know to be reachable somehow, right, are not, are not there in the invariant, then you can always propose a new positive count example and say you must include this in your invariant. Okay. So, so clearly this is, the H is not correct, um, uh, and I can give you a count example for that. Similarly, if, it inc if it's too large and includes, uh, includes bad states, right, and then you can, you can give a negative count example and say, you know, this is something which should not be, because if, if, if that's a part of the invariant, you know, the bad states are reachable, I don't, I, you know, that's clearly wrong, right? But what happens if I gave you some, a set like this, right, which includes a lot of states, and I don't know anything about whether all these states are reachable, I know nothing about it. It's so far into the program that I can't figure out whether, uh, using any of my verification tools, whether those states are reachable, right? So I don't, I, I get, I get, an, um, I get an invariant which includes all the good states I know of and excludes all the bad states I know of, but it's not inductive, right? So think about the loop, in, the verification condition uh, involved in, in checking the inductiveness of a loop, right? That does not hold, right? And then I know it's not inductive and I have to tell you why it's wrong, right? And the only thing I know, if, if I get a counterexample to inductiveness, I'll get two configurations, S1 and S2. Right? S1 belongs to the invariant, and S2 gets out of the invariant. Right? So I want to give you this sample. I really don't know whether you should include S1 or not. I don't know that. Right? But I know that if you include S1, you better include S2, because otherwise the, 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 programs, uh, the invariant that you propose is not going to be inducted. Okay? So that's how you get counterexamples of the form S1 arrow S2, which means that if you include S1, you must include S2. So, so if, if uh, there are two variables like this, then a, a typical sample would look like this. There are positive things and there are negative things, and there are these uh, implication count examples, and you have to come up with an invariant, right, which, um, 
satisfies all these samples. So it should, it should uh, include the positive, exclude the negative, and it can't cut across the, these, uh, these, this, uh, um, the, there should be no arrow from the positive to the negative. So, right, so, um, so what we build is new machine learning algorithms for decision trees that actually do this, right? And I'm gonna go a little faster because I'm running out of time. So, so essentially we, we, we synthesize formulas of this kind. We, we have vectors of booleans and numbers where booleans and numbers describe your, uh, the configuration space. And these can be any function of your configuration. It can say x is a list, you know, this is the number of uh, elements in an array, anything you want. You, you extract this information from this, and then the invariant is going to be a Boolean combination of numerical predicates, which numerical inequalities, um, and Booleans mentioned in your sample. And we're trying to learn a, uh, an invariant which is consistent with that sample. So there are many challenges in adapting machine learning algorithms, right? One challenge is that uh, machine learning algorithms make mistakes, typically. And you have to make sure that they do not make mistakes. But by, if you actually look at most machine learning algorithms, the reason why they make mistakes is a feature, because they, they believe that the input could have noise. So you have to remove the components that, that deal with that, so that uh, you know, uh, they do not generalize so much that they, they become inconsistent with the sample. The second one is that we need to handle implication count examples, so we had to you know, uh, build new decision um, learning algorithms. And the third thing is convergence. We'd like to prove a convergence theorem which says that eventually you will get the invariant if at all an invariant is expressible in the logic. Okay? So decision trees are um, express arbitrary Boolean, Boolean functions uh, of this kind, and um, so I will skip that, but um, um, let me skip continuous attributes for now, and let's, let me give you the gist of the main algorithm. So the, the algorithm works by taking the set of samples and choosing an attribute, and this attribute has to be chosen carefully. Okay? This is what, what really makes sure that your decision tree is going to be small. And you use statistical measures, and we have developed new statistical measures that actually, um, uh, you know, for the ICE world, which work. Um, um, so then once you pick an attribute, you have to, the, the sample separate into two parts, those that satisfy the predicate and those that do not satisfy the predicate. And in the, in the traditional decision tree learning algorithm, there are no implication count examples, so you can just recurse on the left and recurse on the right. But with implication count examples, things are much more tricky, right? Because there are constraints that um, uh, map samples which are on the left to the right and vice versa. So it turns out that um, we can go ahead with the left tree, but as soon as we get to a leaf which is pure, which has only positive examples, we label it pure, but um, some of these have implication arrows, and we will label the edges, ends of those implication arrows also with the constraint. So we immediately say, since this is positive, that's gonna be positive as well, right? And um, by doing this, we can actually um, go ahead and build a decision tree, and you will, as long as things are separable, it will always work and give you a, a correct decision tree consistent with the sample. Um, we have many uh, measures, and unfortunately, I cannot go through all of them. Um, we have entropy, we, we have uh, measures based on entropy, which extends the entropy arguments in uh, classical decision tree learning. And we also have one which um, takes the entropy but uh, penalizes the number of arrows that you cut, number of implication pairs that you cut, because in the, in the, every time you're not, you're not going to be able to uh, uh, not cut these implication pairs, but clearly you, know, you should try not to cut implication pairs. So we have that kind of measure, and both work very well in practice. For consistency, we, we, we change the algorithm so that you know, we remove all the um, uh, uh, things really, like pruning, which are there to deal with um, uh, noise, and so we get actually a consistent learning algorithm. So what about convergence? We have a convergence theorem as well. Now, if you had only Booleans, it's clear it will converge, because there are only finitely many, many formulas, and so you will actually converge, right? Um, but um, recall that our, inf our, our space is actually Booleans and also these inequalities, and there are actually infinitely many formulas here, right? And we want to build, a, um, build one which is still convergent at this level. So one simple way to do this is to, is to bound your threshold. Right, the inequalities have a threshold, you bound the threshold, and you look only for uh, decision trees that use up to that threshold, 
right? And this is finite, so this will, this will always converge, or this will always work. And if it doesn't work, then you can increment the, this, this threshold, right? So iterative, iteratively, you, you try to do it with a smaller threshold till you can't, and then you increase the threshold. But this works only if you have positive and negative examples, right? Because um, if you're positive and negative example, you know, you can't, you can't separate a positive and negative example, then you know that you can't find a decision tree for it. But it turns out that for the ICE algorithm that we build, it's not necessarily true. And we have um, another algorithm which essentially looks at equivalence classes of, uh, of uh, defined by this M, and then it, um, it, um, it builds the decision tree and is guaranteed to always build a decision tree and converge to, a, to an invariant. Um, so the whole thing has been implemented over Boogie and Z3, and the ICE learning algorithm is like a machine learning algorithm, very separate from the program. And you can use it for other things as well. And uh, for, the, for the experiments, we, we, we have to feed all these numerical things uh, as well as uh, Boolean things. And we, we, for most of the um, examples, we do just uh, octagonal um, uh, equ um, you know, uh, uh, expressions. And also, we, we, you can add, manually add anything that you want. You can add nonlinear things also uh, if you wanted to. And uh, the only problem is that the verification oracle should be able to deal with that. So I won't, I'll skip over the experiments. There are more than uh, 50 programs, small programs with intricate loops, uh, up to 100 lines of code, which we have verified using this. All right? And here are some of the invariants learned. It has there are nonlinear examples. There are uh, examples with disjunctions and large constants and things like that. Um, so this, this also won the uh, CIGUS competition. This, this, this tool won the CIGUS competition for invariant synthesis. Um, so I will, I'll, I will uh, not go through this, but I'll conclude. Um, so the, the paper is really about adapting machine learning algorithms for decision trees, classical ones, to build consistent, convergent, ice learning algorithms so that you can synthesize invariants. And the resulting learner is, quite, is competitive. I wouldn't say it's, it's much better or anything like that. It's fairly competitive, and it's a, a very interesting idea. And the future work which I really want to do is uh, do this for much more expressive theories, right? Like, like separation logic theories where we do have some kinds of solvers, but we, the learning algorithm does look like it will work well, and initial experiments suggest that it will work well. And of course, finding new applications where such uh, learning would be useful. Okay. Thank you. Okay, then could you briefly comment on the relationship with testing? So every time I see this, the sample, the choose of the choosing the sample seems essential for the method to work. So often I have the feeling that these machine learning based techniques are as hard as testing sometimes, right? Having a good sample is equivalent as having a good set of tests that really coverages the, the goals. So we, we just use boogie, boogie, whatever count example it gives, that's the sample we give back. We don't do any other thing in all these things. We, we don't, we don't uh, constrain the sample in any way. And it seems to work. I guess I had a similar question. So uh, with the black box, especially when you have a black box, uh, sometimes people use the, um, the shape of the logic in which you're learning the variance to not generate equivalent, input, equivalent samples. Have you thought about this? Um, you mean move to a different logic? Which uh, is yeah, it's, if it's the logic. Algebraic. Yeah. So that is decision trees for us, but I mean, the, but that's that's what the the hypothesis space and the thing that we're trying to reduce is the is the size of the decision tree. But we don't have anything else, so okay. uh, we don't have a you know restricted logic which we learn from. Hey, um, great talk. Um, is this generalizable to Boolean conditions um, that aren't necessarily just um, kind of classical loop invariants, like the uh, relies and guarantees in um, a more concurrent setting? Yes, I think it is. Um, there are straightforward ways of um, of right. I mean, the the invariant synthesis problem and the rely guarantee problem are very. I mean, they are essentially the same. 
And there are papers that actually reduce one from another, which we have worked on. So definitely we can. And we, there are other settings where we, we have done that. We have um, used um, the, such a reduction to get rely guarantee um, uh, assumptions. 